Orange Democratic Movement Party Leader and African Union High Representative for Infrastructure Development, Raila Amolo Odinga yesterday, delivered a speech on the legacy of the former United Nations Secretary General, the late Kofi Annan, at Chatham House in London, United Kingdom. Mr. Odinga said that the world must care about the things Kofi Annan cared about in order to honor him. You will uh, excuse me, I'd a few notes that I, I, I wanted to go on record here um, about Kofi. And I begin by first saying that um, I met Kofi after he took over office as the Secretary General of the United Nations. I was introduced by a Kenyan friend who was working for him, Salim Loon, who would have been with us here today, but um, due to other commitment was not able to come here. Salim was a Kenyan who had been exiled during those difficult times of Kenyan uh, political struggle for democracy. And he had actually become stateless because they had withdrawn his, his, his um, citizenship. But um, after that introduction, we kept now meeting any time I was in New York, I would go and pay a courtesy call to coffee. And we became therefore very close friends. Um, but I want to say, Kofi was many things to many people. And last year, during the, the funeral, a lot of it was said by different people about Kofi. It was like the elephant. Remember the blind people who went to find out what the elephant was like. Some would to touch the tusk, another one the trunk, another one the back, and, and all came up with different impressions of an elephant. That was coffee. <laughs> coffee is, is widely respected for the peace he helped to broker in Kenya. And there is reasonable expectation that we will dwell on that. But Kenya was simply an extension of his wider belief that the world should not spectate when conflicts are consuming civilians in some part of the universe and when state has taken sides in such conflicts. Anand's legacy stands out in three areas. <clears throat> One, the international in intervention in conflict as contained in his doctrine of responsibility to protect. Two, social and economic well-being, especially of citizens of the poor nations. We see that in his approach to issues of poverty in general and HIV and AIDS in particular. Three, diplomacy in global affairs. Anand believed most of the world's conflict could be prevented or stopped without bombs and guns. The end of the Cold War came with deadly conflicts in places like Sierra Leone, the Democratic Republic of Congo, East Timor, and Bosnia, to mention but a few. It came with warlords like Radovan Karadzic, Radko Mladic, and Stovovan Milasovic. This is the world Anand inherited. One of Anand's greatest contributions to global agenda was to refine a policy mandating states to step in wherever and whenever human lives are threatened by hate, disease, or poverty. He advocated an end to the old notion that states can do as they please behind the borders because of sovereignty. The idea that sovereignty is not a shield was a critical part of Anand's legacy to the world. We must also remember that Anand had come to office against the background of Rwanda genocide, where the world had stood aside as armed militia butchered th hundreds of thousands of civilians in that country. He seemed to be permanently balancing the madness and goodness of humanity. Anand approached global problems from the position that as, just as there is limitless capacity for evil in human beings, there is also some potential for goodness in everyone.
if only we listened to each other enough. As of the world geared for invasion of Iraq in 1998, Anand made it clear that he was going to negotiate with Saddam Hussein. He later had the courage to report that he had a good human rapport with Saddam, the bewilderment of those who saw the options as either arms inspectors or bombs. Perhaps the world should have approached Iraq differently. In Kenya, we had the fortune to test announced diplomacy firsthand and for at least two months in 2008. Anand's intervention gave way to the most comprehensive review of our laws and governance structure ever undertaken in our country. And when coffee arrived, because first, the coming of coffee was not just an accident. It was as a result of wider international consultations. Um, Lord uh, Malok Brown is in the audience here. He addressed us early in the morning. He was one of the people who were involved behind the scenes. Uh, first through his then Prime Minister, Gordon Brown. They called me late at night and asked me if uh, we would accept intervention. This followed a contested election results. Uh, for those who may not be aware, uh, the elections had been held, presidential elections, and um, they were being, the results were being broadcast live uh, by all the national television <coughs> networks. And I was leading by over one million votes, with only a few more stations left to be counted. When all of a sudden they stopped live broadcast, <laughs> and uh, now started saying that I was still leading, but my opponent was closing, was fast closing. And the, all the net television networks were stopped from further broadcasting, only the national television. In the end, they announced the results, and the country imploded. And um, a lot of lives were lost. Hell broke loose. People were being butchered all over the place. The very sad occasion where people had run and took shelter in a church. And women and children, and then they poured petrol into that church and burnt them alive. Over 32 people. Another gentleman who had taking shelter in his house with his family of 11, they all also torched alive in the house. So the country was actually burning when they intervened. And suggestions were made first of uh, um, the former Prime Minister of Sierra Leone, uh, who we did not accept. When the, then they mentioned also uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, who was also not acceptable to the other side, that was my friend. Even Kofi was dismissed for being my friend. But upon intervention of Lord Malak Brown and um, the Prime Minister, the other side accepted Kofi to come. Also but supported by the then Ghanaian president, Mr. Uh, John Kufour. And when Kofi arrived in Kenya, started by visiting the parties to the conflict, he visited the then president, had discussions with him, then came to meet with me and my team. But first he insisted on having a meeting with me alone. Then he, he told me that, you know, Paila, there's no standard solution to problems. There's no situation that is re replicated in the world. So we must get a Kenyan solution. But every conflict has a silver lining. And every conflict is also an opportunity. That was his belief. 
from many years of experience that a conflict is also an opportunity. And that is how we approached it. We agreed to set up a team, four from my side and four from the other side. And he said to this team, you know, tell that is called Serena. And the outcome is called the Serena Accord. And here, uh, it started by going back to where the project Kenya started in order to find a solution. What, has it, what is it that is ailing Kenya? And they went and did a deep examination of our country. In the end, they came up with an accord. But there was a clause which was contentious, which could not be resolved. Because they agreed that you're going to have a grand coalition government, power sharing, um, with the position of a president and a prime minister. The other side did not agree on the role of the prime minister. And after this, uh, one of the members of that, to the team used some very, very unprintable words that completely upset Kofi. So he told them he was terminating the negotiations and going to the principals. So he went and met the then president, he came and met me and said he must meet with both of us together. Otherwise he was going to quit. We agreed to meet and the issue was where were we going to have that meeting. And then we agreed to meet in the office of the president, not in the state house. That meeting was attended also by then the chair, uh, chair of the African Union, who was President Mukapa of Tanzania. No, no, not Mukapa, President uh, Kikwete. Kofi was leading a team of three, President Mukapa, former president of Tanzania, and Grasa Machel. From South Africa. When we met, Grasha was not there, but we were three Kibaki, uh, Mkapa, Kikwete, Kofi, and myself, five in the room. And it was a very heated discussion. In the end, they persuaded Mr. Kibaki to accept the clause which his team had refused to accept. And Kofi was very implemental in those del delicate negotiations. So in the end, we agreed to sign an accord. And we came out, Kibaki refused to meet his team. He said, we have agreed and we are going to sign. In the end, we went out, Coffee made all the arrangements with his team and prepared the final draft which we all signed publicly and we shook hands. So shaking hands is now a very famous thing in Kenya, handshake. <laughs> now, fast forward, after this uh, subsequent election, this last elections, we were in a similar situation. The court nullified the presidential results. They were rigged and ordered a repeat of the elections. The country was again on the brink of what had happened the other time. We reached a stage where we took both, both of us took oaths, the, the, the then president and myself. So we had two presidents in the country. <laughs> and uh, we were almost on the brink again of the precipice. This time we decided to use Coffee's advice the other time. There's no other country like Kenya. And we agreed to meet just the two of us. And after very lengthy negotiations, we agreed, a private and secret, there were only two of us. The president came to that meeting driving himself. I also went to that meeting driving myself. And we met for 13 hours. Adjourned, met again, and then we agreed and we prepared a memorandum of understanding. 
and agreed that this is how we want to now how solve this matter once and for all. And we've set us a team, it's called Building Bridges Initiative Team. It's going around the country, collecting views of Kenyans, how we can improve on the constitution which was prepared under the charge of Kofi Annan. Then, after we agreed on this, we came out and we shook hands. This time, just the two of us without Kofi Annan. Thank you very much.